Hey now, good morning. Happy Thursday, PAs, Debbie Saf clients and friends joining us. Good week so far. Your results are in for Eyes Wide Shut. Very good. It scared me a lot just watching the scene over and over. And you guys came up with some really interesting choices, good choices that were just different. Uh, of course, the original score is the Ligeti piece. It was written in the 50s. This movie's in 99. And um, just shows you how simple a scene can be, but putting some terrifying music, not, not a big heavy metal band, not a huge orchestra, simple piano, just, and the repetition of those two semitones, very, very scary. Um, why, we don't know. That's the beauty of music, of all the stuff that we don't know. Okay, but I thought since so much of that movie is about, uh, uses the Shostakovich piece, the very famous waltz, uh, we should re-look at Shostakovich and um, see his genius. So let's take a, another look. Dmitry Shostakovich, quite a name, Soviet Russian composer and pianist, um, regarded as one of the biggest uh, composers of the 20th century, not just Russian composers, but really biggest composers, uh, used a pretty cool harmonic language and um, all under this horrible man, Stalin. We're going to look at Stalin. Uh, we've talked a little bit about Joseph Stalin, but, uh, you know, the dictator, the communist dictator in Russia, um, and kind of ta think about, you know, the horrible story of how Shostakovich was able to uh, be, uh, be, you know, thrive as an artist in this uh, government that was very oppressive. So we're going to figure out how he did that and how he um, was able to still write great music. So, um, Let's let's talk about uh, Dimitri. Born 1906 in Saint Petersburg, Russia. So where's my free Google map? There it is. Let's let's uh, head from Hollywood to Russia, where it seems a little bit a little bit dangerous. Uh, he dies in 1975 in Moscow, Russia. So lives kind of a long life, uh, pretty much for being a highly OCD, obsessive, cleanly. Uh, we'll get into his personality a little bit later, but uh, uh, mother teaches him music when he's, n uh, when he's nine. So uh, this guy writes 15 symphonies, six concerti, um, 15 string quartets, a piano quintet, two pieces of string octet, solo piano works, including two piano sonatas, uh, early set of pre preludes and a later set of 24 play preludes and fugues. That's a lot of music. Um, and he he had kind of a, uh, different styles of music. I mean, we're talking about under the umbrella of classical music, but um, he kind of have a, had a hybrid voice. He had different, different music. As we're listening, we're gonna be hearing different uh, instrumentation, different percussion instruments. Um, marimbas, glockenspiels. I what I love about his music is that there's a whole lot of humor and a lot of movement, excitement in, in it. very influenced by Stravinsky, who was uh, another Russian composer going on at the same time, and also Mahler, who was a romantic composer that had gone on a little bit before him. Um, let's look at our timeline, because Stravinsky obviously, as we know, lives a really long life, but we're looking, do, if you remember Prokofiev, who was another famous Russian composer that we looked at, Prokofiev's going on at the same time. He's writing music, Stravinsky's writing music, so we have all these Russians dominating uh, classical music. Dimitri's parents they came from Siberia and uh, his father was a biologist and engineer and his mother was a pianist. So she, she teaches him and um, 
uh, when his dad died, the 16 year old had to go out and get himself a job. So he got a job in the cinema, playing music to accompany silent films. We've looked at this with other composers. If you remember, Carl Stalling started uh, playing you know, organ or you know, at the local theater to silent films. That's how these composers get their, um, some of their training. But uh, Shostakovich does go to the conservatory, gets a, you know, a great classical education. Um, 19 years old, um, writes, composes his first symphony. Um, already a prodigy at 19 years old and um, after graduation goes on to a, a pretty good career as a pianist and a composer. Now Stalin, he lives under Stalin's regime from 1924 to when Stalin dies in 1953. Uh, we talked about Stalin dying the same day as Prokofiev, 1953. Very strange how that happened. Um, so Shostakovich was, uh, not, not that this is going to be political, but he was really forced to live under this um, totalitarian regime most, most of his career. His music was very judged by political rather than musical criteria, which, was, which is terrible. Um, you know, we know that Hitler loved Wagner and used his music but Wagner was long dead, of course, so um, Stalin wants to use Shostakovich as a living composer to, um, you know, for propaganda and stuff. So uh, it, it, every day brought more bad news to Shostakovich because he was very lonely, very afraid of doing, writing the wrong kind of music. Because these were the days where if you did something wrong, it's probably still like that, actually, with Putin. Uh, if you did something wrong, you were killed. <laughs> there wasn't really a warning there. Uh, and many of Shostakovich's friends were killed um, just for not you know, following the government. It's, it's really not until 1936 when Stalin all of a sudden arrives in, for an uh, opera performance um, that Shostakovich is working on. And, he, and um, after that, Stalin was like, you, you, this is too avant-garde. You can't, you can't write this kind of music, not under my government. So, of course, um, Shostakovich is, you know, I mean, what do you say to that? I'm, I'm an artist. I'm, I'm free to do what I want. You can't, you can't. You can't say that to Stalin, who, you know, as we know, killed more people than Hitler, actually. So after fierce criticism of Shostakovich's music in 1936, he, he changes the direction of his music, specifically with Symphony Number no. 5. That's when it becomes, Stalin likes this because it becomes a, a universal message of triumph for the Russian Communist Party. And um, it made Shostakovich a public hero. Now, I don't know if he loved the music that he was writing, he probably did, but I mean, you really feel a slave to these people and these people that don't understand music and they don't, you know, I think, I mean, he was troubled. Imagine writing in times like that where you're like, if this, you know, now it's like if we have lyrics or rap or poetry that offends, you know, they were living in um, times where the wrong, you know, measure or bar or chord could offend. It sounds ridiculous, but again, it wasn't that long ago.
1960, Shostakovich gives in to pressure and joins the Communist Party. He didn't want to, but uh, it caused him personal miser misery and friends hated him. Friends and colleagues, I mean, he was ostracized. He, people would walk across the street. It, it, it was probably confusing because it, there was probably a no win. You either go with the, the government or you don't go and whichever way you decide, you're gonna lose people on either either ends. And like I said, a number of his friends and colleagues were executed during this period known as the Great Terror. So just so sad. Um, so as a result, commissions begin to fall off and Shostakovich's income fell by about three quarters. I mean, so now he's poor. His fourth symphony was due to, to premiere in 1936, but he withdrew it because it was, it was banned. So the symphony wasn't performed until 1961. So, I mean, he had to really create a low profile. Um, by doing this, he composed a lot of film scores, about, I don't know, 36 film scores, um, a genre favored by Stalin. Stalin liked that, that he was, he was doing this. Shostakovich suffered um, pretty bad health, chronic bad health later. Um, he couldn't give up cigarettes and he couldn't give up vodka. He dies of lung cancer in 75. Um, uh, a lot of the stuff that he wrote was in his head. Think about, think about how hard this is. Um, Shostakovich once said that as a composer, he thought long and wrote fast. This is probably how Mozart, probably some of the other people did, meaning that he would, he would compose all of the whole piece in his head before he even would write it down, um, which is an amazing feat because some of his music is over an hour long. Some of his symphonies are. So to hear the entire symphony in your head before you write it down, I couldn't even, I can't even fathom that. Um, we talked about his OCD. He was an obsessive man. He was obsessed with cleanliness. Regularly sent himself cards to test how well the postal service was working, uh, which is something I used to do. But I mean, you know, uh, he was fragile and very nervous. And um, when he asked if he believed in God, Shostakovich said no, and I'm very sorry about it. So uh, we're hearing a lot of big, we're hearing a lot of humor, good, you know, patriotic sounding, brilliant music. What I love is we're, we're really going to discover something wonderful that he wrote in 1934. So this is in between all of this very serious classical music, Stalin's still alive. I don't know where this idea came from. I was trying to find out, but he writes a jazz suite and that's, that's really what we're here for. The Jazz Suite for Orchestra Number One. Okay, so Number Two comes in 1938, a few years later. Um, this Jazz Suite has three movements, and um, it's scored for three saxophones, uh, soprano, alto, and tenor, two trumpets, trombone, woodblock, snare, uh, drums, cymbals, glockenspiel, xylophone, banjo, Hawaiian guitar, piano, violin, and double bass. So he's got, that's quite a big ensemble. And uh, take a listen. The 
it sound like jazz music? Uh, not really, right? Does it sound like his classical music? No, not really. <laughs> um, uh, very odd instrumentation. Instrumentation that I can think of perhaps sounds a little bit like we looked at a long time ago, the Three Penny Opera, Kurt Weill's music, kind of that gypsy-like, street-like sounds that's a little bit harsh sounding. Um, see if you've heard of this song. That's Shostakovich's Jazz Waltz Number no. 2, made very famous uh, by Kubrick's Eyes Wide Shut, my favorite Kubrick film, FYI. Um, played a lot, though. You've probably heard... So the, that's probably his most famous piece. But the Jazz Suite... So that's in, that's in Suite Number no. 2. So what I played was from Number 1. And Suite Number no. 2 was called Suite for Jazz Orchestra Number no. 2. And um, what are we hearing? It... it this is his version of what jazz perhaps would sound like because when you're in when you're in Russia you're hearing stories from foreigners and what people are hearing all around the world and you're getting glimpses I don't know if you know I just don't know if he had a lot of recordings I doubt he was listening to Duke Ellington or if that was available there um, I read that Scott Joplin was available to some of these composers living in, in Russia. So I can hear I can hear Scott Joplin's influence in some of these things. Um, the Ragtime, the Foxtrot, some of those things. But where 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 is he this what what kind of music? This is just the most beautiful, wonderful music. Some of my maybe my favorite music in the world. Uh, isn't it? I mean, isn't it just lovely? It's super romantic, but it's dark romantic. It's a, I love the, the different instrumentation. It is like a jazz, uh, honky-tonk jazz, you know, saxophone, vibraphone, accordion, street jazz. It's not improvised, though. I mean, Duke Ellington was improvising stuff. Um, Fats Waller, they were improvising. This is all strictly notated. This doesn't sound like improvisatory, improvisatory jazz at all. It's not supposed to. It's notated um, correctly. Scott Joplin's was notated too. But that doesn't mean that it can't be fun and, and free-like. Um, just Shostakovich, I mean, genius. I mean, I don't know where this these pieces came from in his mind, in his head, what he thought about them. I have no idea. It seems just, it came out of the 1930s and uh, it, it's what a treat. I mean, I love his, I do really love his other classical music, but boy, I mean, these are gems, these, these little, this, his little jazz suites. So w part of what I love so much about Shostakovich's music is it's brilliant, right? Nonetheless, it's brilliant. But the circumstances that he wrote under were even more trying. It, it, the government imposed standards of what, how he had to live was just, and politically at that time, uh, in, in Soviet Russia, it must have been so hard, but he still created beautiful music, great music, violent music, all these kind of things. And I wanted, and I, we did talk about the, the jazz suite in it, and I showed you my um, uh, favorite piece. A lot of this was classical jazz music. This was a new genre going back to the 30s for Shostakovich, even though that suite number two was written in the 50s. Uh, this is music that's kind of becoming less, it's still concert music, but coming, becoming more jazz influenced. And that's what Gershwin's genius was with Rhapsody in Blue. Starting from the 20s and 30s, music became much more, uh, not just serious classical music, although that was still going on indeed. It became a little bit more popular 
incorporating jazz rhythms, incorporating jazz orchestrations, stuff like that. So I just wanted to relook at the genius of Shostakovich because even though we're re-looking re and revisiting composers we've talked about, we need reinforcement because I know one or two thank times whenever I read or listen to something, it doesn't doesn't process. So we're going to need to, this year I'm going to relook at stuff a few times because we need to process these things. At least for me, that's how I learned. So I hope you enjoyed re-looking at Shostakovich and then tomorrow your film turn results for the scary Eyes Wide Show. Okay, have a great rest of the day. See you tomorrow. Bye. <music>